Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Inside the Issue. It's the day we talk about the management of adverse effects with BTK inhibitors, particularly in CLL, but also mantle cell. We have a great faculty today, uh, Dr. Farouk Awan uh, from the uh, Harold Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center and the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and Dr. Kerry Rogers from The Ohio State University in Columbus. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As we do with all our webinars, we're putting out a very brief one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey. Uh, you'll get a lot more out of this if you take the survey. We'd appreciate it as well. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars. If you're into podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series. Uh, so we did an entire issue just on ocular toxicities in one of these programs recently, particularly with ADCs, but uh, uh, this program will be available as well. We do webinars all the time. Next week, we're doing a really uh, fun one on ovarian suppression in uh, breast cancer. We have Dr. Kathy Miller and Ann Partridge to talk about that. And then the following week, we're heading out to the GU Cancer Symposium. We'll be doing uh, three uh, satellite meetings out there. If you're in the San Francisco area, uh, stop on by. For the rest of the country and world, uh, we're going to be putting this online. It's a uh, Pacific time, so a little bit late. But on Wednesday night, the 15th, we'll be talking about renal cell cancer. Thursday night, prostate cancer. Great faculties for all these, as you can see. And then on Friday night, urethelia bladder cancer. And then the next day, on Saturday, we're doing a day-long multi-tumor meeting with the North Carolina Oncology Association and com uh, combined South Carolina Oncology Society meeting in Charlotte. Again, if you're in the area, stop on by. Otherwise, the entire day will be online. We have about 16 investigators. We'll be talking about a whole bunch of different tumor types, updating people on where we're at. But today, we're going to focus on a very practical issue that's been out there for the last few years, uh, the use of BTK inhibitors and specifically tolerabilities that come up with that. And before we get into it, mostly what we're going to do, as we always do, is uh, present cases from community-based oncologists. And believe it or not, we've actually got 11 cases lined up here. I really wanted to make rounds. I don't even know if I'm going to show any slides. I just want to chat and talk about taking care of patients mainly. We really appreciate these docs uh, working with us uh, to record these cases and uh, looking forward to get some feedback on that. Uh, so I just want to kind of get warmed up before we get into this, talk about a couple of interesting news items just to keep in mind. And Farouk, uh, we saw uh, last week the, uh, from my point of view, long-awaited uh, approval. I've been waiting for a while, but uh, pertubrutinib gets approved in mantle cell. Uh, there was some great data presented at the ASH meeting. And of course, everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen in terms of CLL to me, uh, Farouk, you know, it looks like a great option for patients uh, who've already progressed on a, another B BTK inhibitor and venetoclax uh, anti-CD20. Any thoughts about this approval and you know, maybe whether or not we're going to see this in CLL as well, Farouk? Sure. Thank you for having me. And I'm uh, very uh, pleased to be here and joining you guys. So, yes, I agree. Uh, I think pertubrutinib is, is a major advance in the field. Uh, we've all been waiting for eagerly for an option for patients who progress on BTK inhibitor. Uh, so this is uh, promising. Uh, we do see um, um, some efficacy in this setting, in the relapsed post-BTK setting, uh, even in patients with high-risk disease, uh, 17P deleted disease and the blastoid morphology for mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, so this is a promising um, option for patients who don't otherwise have a lot of options. But I would say that that also raises an important point uh, that maybe these patients should be considered for a CAR T before they actually get to pertubrutinib or progress on BTK inhibitors. And that's really the major discussion point in the field. When do you go take your patients to CAR T? Because we all know that the CAR T for mantle cell, just like for large cell lymphoma, is underutilized. So are you missing that sweet spot and then waiting to get on pertubrutinib because you may not get the disease control that you might need to get patients to CAR T. And that's a really great point. And Carrie, last night we did a program on lymphomas with uh, Chris Flowers uh, and Laurie Sen, and 
Of course, we were talking about uh, this, but also the new first line trials that came out. We're going to talk about this later, combining uh, 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 BTK uh, plus uh, chemotherapy, uh, the Triangle study and the SHINE study. We're going to talk later about uh, tolerability issues. But any thoughts about pertubrutin, and particularly uh, the topic tonight in terms of safety? You know, I hear from investigators it's much better tolerated, quality of life wise. I'm not sure I know that much about cardiovascular hypertension. What's your take in terms of tolerability, Carrie? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mostly uh, see people as CLL, but I've had quite a lot of opportunity to use pertubrutinib on clinical trials. And I will say that patients tend to really um, like pertubrutinib, and I see very little toxicity with it, including some patients that thought it was better um, than actually venetoclax that they'd taken. I think the cardiovascular toxicities you would predict to be less because it's reversible, so it binds and unbinds the targets. Um, and we don't see like a high incidence of hypertension or AFib like you would expect with the covalent BTK inhibitors like ibrutinib and even a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib. Um, however, the, like the kind of, uh, medium PFS in the CLL, like highly refractory population it's been used in is, you know, like somewhere around a year and a half. And some of those cardiovascular toxicities are a little bit later. Um, so I'm not sure if you keep giving it, if you'll see that, you know, the cumulative incidence tends to go up with BTK inhibitors. And I don't know if people have been on it that long, but in general, I would say it's extremely well tolerated. And I do think at least the earlier time point data suggests that the cardiovascular toxicity is less, which is expected. So I should mention too, I didn't realize until I went through Farouk's uh, CV that he was actually at Ohio State. And Carrie, you were telling me you had, your office was right next to each other. So you're got a little reunion here going on tonight, I guess, huh? Yeah, right next to the mouse labs. Yes. <laughs> the mouse <laughs> labs. <laughs> All right. So here's the other approval that came out this month. Uh, again, much awaited. Uh, Xanabrutin had been CLL. It was already previously approved in mantle cell. Farouk, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about uh, this. I, I work with, I was mentioning, you know, we did a program with Jennifer Brown a couple of weeks ago, the PI from the study. Uh, any thoughts about Xanabrutinib? Again, particularly from a tolerability point of view, but just in general about uh, the data that was presented at ASH. Uh, so very promising. Um, we all know, we've all heard about it. Uh, Xanabrutinib um, uh, appears to be better tolerated than a brutinib. The side effect profile is uh, uh, appears to be uh, better, uh, especially the cardiovascular side effects. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that those side effects are completely gone, but the incidence is lower. Uh, kind of similar to what we saw with acalabrutinib as compared to um, a brutinib. Uh, so it does appear that the field is moving towards a more better to tolerated uh, compound and uh, slowly and gradually we are getting more and more uh, tolerable drugs. Uh, having said that, the hypertension incidence is the same, the bleeding risks are the same with Xanabrutinib. So it's not without its share of problems, but it's definitely a nice tool to have. We also have to remember, uh, frankly, that Ibrutinib has the most long-term data and we know that if patients who do continue on Ibrutinib do do fairly well. Granted, uh, those are usually younger patients and otherwise patients who may not have a lot of comorbid conditions and uh, not necessarily above 70. But there are patients who have done really well eight, nine years out now uh, on a brutinib. So, uh, you know, we wanted to focus on tolerability, but based on our conversation before we got started, I have to ask you to verbalize just briefly, because I know you could go on for a long time, Let's say your questions about, the, of course, the big issue there is the efficacy. It looked like they reported better efficacy, which we haven't seen before. Let's just say you verbalized to me a few you know, questions about uh, that. Any, maybe you could summarize that and we'll see what uh, Carrie thinks. Sure. Uh, so I'll summarize it quickly. Um, if you look at the subset analyses, uh, the efficacy was only better in the U.S. and the Chinese cohort or the Asian cohort, I should say. And if you look at the Asian cohort, only four patients in the Asian cohorts were treated outside of China. So it's I will call it the Chinese cohort. Um, out of those, it's almost 10% of the study population, so roughly in the 50 to 60 patient range. Uh, 
So that's a substantial number. And the only benefit that you had with, in terms of efficacy and improvement in survival of PFS was in the Chinese cohort and in the U.S. cohort. Now, we can argue that in the U.S. cohort, uh, we might have underlying biases, as is reflected from the patient or uh, market data, that utilization of ibrutinib has dropped over the last few years. So, as practitioners, we've moved away from ibrutinib. So, that's a general sensor in the market in the U.S. right now. You don't see that many patients nowadays on ibrutinib. So, it was expected that ibrutinib would underperform in the U.S. market. Um, but the Chinese market, it was interesting. And what was even more interesting is that outside of those two cohorts, there was absolutely no difference in the big European cohort. So that begs the question is, is the Chinese patient population doing well because they tend to do well? Maybe they're a younger patient population. Maybe they have better tolerability. I don't know the answer to that. And the same breakdown was not available for the adverse events. Were the adverse events also worse because there is more acknowledgement of those in the U.S. cohort versus Maybe the Chinese don't have that many adverse events, as has been suggested in the past by some studies um, in the CLL patient population, that maybe we are just picking up the neutropenias and cytopenias because they get uh, documented and maybe patients don't report as much or we don't anticipate those issues. So there's so many minor details that are still um, up in the air because why don't you see a PFS benefit in the European patient population? I, I don't see an obvious reason for that. And similarly in the COVID deaths or COVID cases, uh, that is a problem with the Xenobrutinib data is that there was a higher frequency of COVID, which we assume did not happen in the Chinese patients uh, because of the zero COVID policies. Um, and uh, how does that impact? So I think a more granularity to that data will give us more confidence to use the drug more and be comfortable with its use. Um, and there are so many minor little details which are buried into the, uh, the supplements, I guess, which we would have to pay attention to so that we can be completely convinced that it's better and safer. But right now, the way I leave it is, it's, it's a promising option. It appears to be better tolerated. It appears to be more effective. But in, in my mind, it's, it's not a done deal. So, uh, Kerry, uh, sometimes I think about CLL like the Talmud. You could just talk about it all day long, particularly at your place or at Ohio State. I remember we did 10 webinars on CLL the first year of the pandemic, and it was never, it was always exciting. Just every case was different. And yeah, we could spend a lot of time. Anything you want to sort of add to what Farouk said before we sort of dive into the cases? Yeah, for Xanabrutinib, <clears throat> well, I just wanted to add that I, you know, so there's um, the study comparing Ibrutinib to Xanabrutinib, and then obviously Elevate RR a few years ago that was Ibrutinib to Calibrutinib, and I think there's a few, like, key differences between these that make them just kind of different. Um, but both of them, I think I was really excited that it's an opportunity to do like a randomized comparison of adverse events. And granted, since it's open label, maybe the investigators felt differently about them, but on its face value, it's a randomized comparison of adverse events. So I think that's always neat to see side by side. I think this whole idea of, of like showing the efficacy of Xanabrutinib is better than Ibrutinib. I think uh, Farouk pointed out like a lot of things that kind of went into that, that maybe in terms of PFS, it, if, if it, in the setting, it kind of set it up to be better. I just, for myself, the primary endpoint of that study was overall response rate, and it was not progression-free survival. So if you look at Elevate RR, which was the ibrutinib and calibrutinib, it was very clean. Primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Data wasn't even released until that was known, and they had their like pre-specified events, you know. And I think when you have a study where you, you know, add more patients to try to make that um, endpoint of PFS that wasn't your original primary endpoint, then you get a lot of other factors at play. But at its base, anabrutinib is an effective. Um, BTK inhibitor that's more tolerable than ibrutinib. And I think uh, similar to other diseases where you have multiple like targeted agents, kind of like CML, you will get one that is more or less tolerable for an individual patient. And I think that's still true. So there's finer points in the data, but the nature of it is we have a third option for people with CLL that I definitely believe has fewer side effects than ibrutinib. And then we can have like a whole discussion about whether or not we think the efficacy in whatever setting is, is better. I don't personally I believe there's some sort of massively better efficacy with it, but the, I think the tolerability is real. 
So you're getting the chat room all excited, but I'm just, hold on, hold on. Let's get back to the race. Just one other point. Again, uh, any situation right now where you, uh, Farouk, that you could describe where you'd like to use Ibrutinib first line or even you, in what situation would, can you describe a situation right now where you'd like to use it in CLL? Um, from the pause, uh, I'm not sure if I can justify using Ibrutinib right now. Um, in any setting in for CLL patients, maybe for primary CNS lymphomas and secondary CNS lymphomas, I can make an argument, graft versus host disease maybe. Outside of those indications, it's getting harder and harder to justify using a brutinib outside of a clinical trial. Agree or disagree, uh, Carrie? You know, one the only time I kind of hear it referred to sometimes is DEL-17P high risk because there's longer data, but you tell me. Yeah, I mean, I think the Elevate RR study, which was in high-risk patients, although I still haven't seen a breakdown of like 11Q versus 17P in that study, despite the fact that I've literally asked everybody for that, um, you know, kind of when you have, uh, you know, a hazard ratio of one for PFS between those two drugs in that setting, I'm not I'm sure that that really... Um, that that is is still true, but there are some like young fit patients that will only take a pill once a day. So prior to Xanabrutinib being approved, that was the option. I mean, it sounds like a small consideration. Um, and of course, the ability to use PPIs now with a calibrutinib has removed that barrier from use of a calibrutinib with like the the update to tablets so the formulation change. So I do think like young fit patients that would only take a pill once a day. And then I have actually had some patients that had multiple um, like CLL and other. B cell histologies like LPL or, or marginal zone. And I have used ibrutinib in some of those cases because I had the broadest experience across diseases. Um, but I think the um, number of patients where I would select ibrutinib is decreasing compared to uh, selecting a different BTK inhibitor. All right. So let's get into some cases here. And before we, uh, we're going to be presenting a bunch of patients with uh, complications or BTK inhibitors. But I'm going to start out though, just with the question of a uh, uh, the use of BTK in older patients. We have two uh, elderly, very elderly patients so where this was a consideration. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Here's Dr. Eric Rupard, who has a 90-year-old lady with CLL. 90-year-old woman with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. She was diagnosed 20 years ago by another oncologist and followed with observation only. She was very much against treatment and really didn't have indications for treatment. In 2021, she started to develop symptomatic anemia. Hemoglobin had kind of slowly declined over the years, and now it was dipping into the 8 and 9 range, significantly below 10. Because of her fatigue, she has underlying COPD, which was also contributing. I offered her a trial of acalabrutinib. She developed fatigue. She also developed headache, which, of course, is common with acalabrutinib, and some diarrhea. So a few questions for the faculty members. How do you treat your very elderly patients with CLL? Do you treat someone who is 90 differently than you'd treat someone who is 80? I assume you'd treat them differently than you'd treat someone who is 70 or 65. How do the very elderly tolerate the rutin kinase inhibitors? So Farouk, any thoughts? You know, he was telling me that this woman almost immediately, you know, she'd fought, she didn't want to be on therapy for years and years and fought it all the way. And she started, you know, saying, verbalizing nonspecific complaints like the day she started taking it. So he thought maybe there was a little bit of a, I don't know, placebo, reverse placebo effect. But, you know, clinically in terms of, you know, what you might say on rounds, how do you deal with a patient like this that you want to treat with a BTK inhibitor? <clears throat> So, uh, you know, I think age uh, is an is interesting or tricky um, because, you know, 90 is the new 80 or maybe the new 70 nowadays. So it all depends on the functional status of the patients. You know, I had an 84-year-old who just got married and is, you know, he's uh, doing well. He decided to get married and his wife is 53. And then another 90-year-old is fully functional and driving around and doing her own groceries and being very independent. So I think it also depends on the functional status of the patient. There is no easy way to answer this question, in my opinion, except for a brutinib. We really don't know if these um, drugs necessarily are worse in the elderly uh, outside of a brutinib. We do know that patients who are 70 and above from multiple studies on a brutinib tend to have more side effects and cardiovascular issues. So that's what we do know. And we definitely 
in my practice, don't use a brutinib uh, for patients above 70. Not that we'd use a brutinib that much anyway. Uh, but in the very elderly patient, acalabrutinib with or without ubinutuzumab does give you um, good responses. I've not had too many issues and I have a fair number of patients on acalabrutinib doing fine. But if they do have issues with headaches uh, or diarrhea or rashes for that matter, that would be a good reason to consider switching to xanabrutinib. That would be where bertabrutinib might be a great option for these patients. And then potentially even venetoclax. I don't see why venetoclax is out of the question because these patients can be safely transitioned through the ramp up on venetoclax. But I would probably stay within the BTK world for this particular scenario and at least start with xanabrutinib trial and see how that goes. So, uh, uh, Carrie, any thoughts? And also, Matthew in the chat room has an interesting point, which I, I, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about uh, maybe relevant to a starting therapy in an older, frail patient. He, uh, he says he's been trying to figure out what the dose reduction schedule is for a Cala and Zanu. And in fact, there is no dose reduction. So, tell me how you do that. No, so um, I think that the one thing I try not to do is sell my elderly patients short. So um, I've actually had two people in their 90s, one of whom lives in a facility who I started treatment with a calibrutinib and they're doing great. Um, so they're not immune to the same side effects other people can get, but you don't want to sell them short on an effective therapy when they could do well. And I think, too, for like the elderly, I mean, venetoclax is a good option, too. And you kind of have the same thought, like, which is going to be better? I know a lot of them can have transportation issues and volume overload can be an issue with Ben. Some of them, if they have cardiovascular side effects, are like, we're definitely doing venetoclax. I think um, for the very elderly, too, when you select a first treatment, I always think about how high risk is the CLL and what's their life expectancy. So in the 60s, you're looking at like 30 30, 40 years of life expectancy and sequencing all the agents. And in someone in their 90s, their natural life expectancy is probably not like much more than 10 years, right? So they, most of them will only get one CLL treatment, especially if they hadn't needed treatment for 20 years. So I don't worry as much about like, what do you do first, next? Are you going to do CAR-T? And more worry about like, what would like improve this person's disease symptoms while impairing their quality of life the least? I think that also when you think about anti-CD20s added to a CALA, yes, there's a small PFS benefit, but do you really want to expose someone to the risks of like COVID with an anti-CD20 and viral infections for a small PFS benefit for someone that's probably not going to progress in their lifespan? So I do think about those a little more, but I try not to sell them short on saying, you know, not to treat them or only give an anti-CD20 when I know they could do well in a BTK inhibitor. And I've definitely had that. And I also get very elderly patients or even mid eighties ask me like, oh, could I even get treatment for this? I'm like, sir, I just spent 20 minutes explaining your treatment options. What did you think I was doing? You know? And then he took a calibrutinib for three days and was like, hey, I stopped passing out on the golf course. I'm like, so, <laughs> so, so you kind of like, you know, I think like that's a different way to um, kind of approach it there. And I'm sorry, I forgot what the thing so, was you asked me specifically because I was so pumped to answer the other question. I don't know if it comes back to me, I'll remember it. But uh, Farouk, I know you've done a lot of work on hypertension and BTK inhibitors. There's a a comment in the chat room might affect your blood pressure. Akrita wants to know, what's your perception of using pertubrutinib in BTK-naive patients? But more importantly, there's a real quick case that I want to run by you from Dr. McKenna in the chat room. Elderly, severe CHF, V-fib, defibrillator, mild CRF, anticoagulation for AFib, GI bleed, acute GI bleed, treated with ven abinutuzumab, now has relapse. Uh, what would you be thinking about? She brings up the issue of pertubrutinib. She says CAR-T. What would you do with this patient with severe cardiac disease? Would you try a BTK inhibitor? What would you do, Farouk? Uh, if, wow. <laughs> so if, I think goals of care discussion would be a good start <laughs> with that patient too. Uh, but if you were to treat that patient, uh, the first thing I would start off by is asking what was the TP53 status, uh, deletion 17P, and TP53 mutation status, number one, the duration of response uh, on the first line venetoclax. If a, if the patient did have a durable remission and lasted for a couple of years, I am inclined to use it again. 
and I think we can get some benefit out of reusing venetoclax. And then uh, if not, then that would be perfectly reasonable to try pertubrutinib uh, as an option for these patients. Uh, so that's so Dr. the McKenna. second question. And then the first question right. was, uh, that was... Yeah, uh, pertubrutinib. Yes. Incidentally, that case was, un she says, she puts in the chat room, was unmutated, no other high risk feature. The other question was, uh, uh, start the first BTK inhibitor being pertubrutinib, like a patient yeah, like this so, with severe heart. If you could, would you do it? Uh, I'm not, I haven't seen, uh, I'm not convinced that I have seen the data of uh, starting pertubrutinib right off the bat. Um, it might be a reasonable option. Is it going to be better than um, what we have currently. So here's the deal. Nobody's here arguing, or I haven't seen anyone in the CLL community argue about the efficacy of acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib or uh, ibrutinib. I mean, they're very effective drugs. And um, nobody cares about uh, response rates, really. I mean, that's, that's, that's a very secondary endpoint uh, as far as the patient is concerned. I mean, they really could care about disease control and toxicity at this point. Uh, so I think that's why uh, I haven't seen the data. Uh, what I have seen is that in patients who are abrutinib intolerant or acalabrutinib intolerant, uh, and then they've got to pertubrutinib, it did have efficacy. Uh, but that efficacy was not necessarily better if you were BTK resistant. So the efficacy of pertubrutinib stays the same. So is that efficacy better than what we saw with Acala or Ibrutinib or Xanabrutinib for that matter? I don't know the answer to that. So this would not be a slam dunk. I will switch everyone to pertubrutinib as frontline right now. Now, obviously, if we see some very convincing head-to-head -head data, which is ongoing, the study is getting close to being accrued with the Ibrutinib uh, versus pertubrutinib trial, um, we might have more information about that, but not as my standard of care right now. So, uh, Carrie, I like your thoughts on this, and also a whole bunch of people in the chat room reminded, <laughs> reminded us of what you and I both forgot, which is a really important question, dose reductions with Xano and Acala. Oh. Yeah, well, the, I can, I definitely want to talk about peer to brutinib, but the dose reductions. So, I mean, I brutinib has like a label with dose reductions. The Acala is really hard because you reduce to daily. You probably don't get as good occupancy. And so I actually uh, always worry when I dose reduce that I might be getting really intermittent dosing and not getting the efficacy out of the drug. And, and so, um, I, you know, if people don't tolerate it or need a dose reduction, obviously you have to do something, but I've actually seen some people just dose reduce older patients because they were old, even though they were tolerating the full dose just fine and feeling awesome. And I don't really think that's a good idea. I think that's kind of selling your older patients short. So if the question was about a planned dose reduction in older patients, I definitely don't do that. And I agree. I think it's very hard. Like I have gone to daily dosing of a calibrutinib in some cases, um, but I just worry that you don't get the full like receptor occupancy. Um, and Xanabrutinib has like, I think one like other dose reduction you can do, but I, I don't have as much experience with that one. Um, so I, I do think that's a really hard question um, for dose reduction. Is it okay if I talk so about pertubrutinib? Oh. Yeah, go for it. I just wanted to add on first line pertubrutinib. I think one of the major concerns is some of the resistance mutations that are seen with pertubrutinib would also confer resistance to ibrutinib, xanabrutinib, and acalabrutinib based on where they are, and that we see them in people whose CLLs become resistant to those other drugs. So you'd have to know that the progression-free survival with pertubrutinib by itself is better than PFS of a, a covalent, like approved BTK inhibitor for CLL and then PERTO. So that that's a reason that I think you really have to do those studies front line to do that. That being said, if you're looking at someone with severe cardiovascular comorbidities who probably can't get CAR-T if he's had V-fib and AFib and bleeding and all this stuff, right. sure. and you just have to do something for their CLL, and it sounds like that person might have some competing comorbidities that, you know, they're unlikely to die of the CLL in the long term. And you just got to do some kind of effective therapy. And, you know, venetoclax retreatment is obviously an option in some cases, but not in all. It's reasonable trying just knowing that this isn't something that's like a frontline evidence-based slam dunk. It'd be kind of like best option for this patient in a really difficult spot kind of situation, if that makes any sense. 
Speaking of that, I'd like to hear what you think about this patient. So this is an 87-year-old, and he's frail. He's developing dementia, falls. So I observed him as long as I possibly could and ultimately felt that I had to start him on some form of therapy. I tried starting him on a calibrutinib on a BID dosing, but he didn't tolerate it for these very nonspecific reasons, increasing fatigue, anorexia, declining performance status. So I held the drug and then based on relatively little data, I placed him on once a day a calibrutinib. Now on once a day a calibrutinib, he's tolerating it well, and his lymphocyte counts are slowly diminishing, his platelets are slowly recovering, his hemoglobin has recovered, and he's doing okay. My question, is there data for once a day acalabrutinib? And then just, you know, how to manage the frail elderly. This whole field of geriatric oncology is becoming more prominent. And how do we manage, how do we assess, how do we take care of these patients? Any thoughts about uh, the strategy that was employed here, Farouk, of giving once a day, uh, you know, Jen, uh, uh, Carrie brought up her concerns about that. Any thoughts about this case? What would you have done? Uh, so it's not unreasonable to try a dose de-escalation uh, in patients who are having um, side effects, and that's not unreasonable. Uh, when you get to 100 milligrams daily, you do have um, around 80, high 80s to low 90% saturation of the receptor. Uh, so that's why it's not the preferred uh, modality. Um, but I think what we also fail to realize that maybe those patients who are elderly might have other drugs that they're on who which can increase the concentration of acalabrutinib. Azol is a classic example, amiodarone and those kind of things, and other medicines that they might be on which potentially can increase the the um, serum concentration of acalabrutinib. So I think it's important to go through their uh, medication list and make sure that there are no interactions. That's an easy fix. Generally, I try not to do 100 milligrams PID unless I am compelled to use them with a competing drug. And then I monitor their side effects. Is it unreasonable to do that? Uh, no. Um, it's probably okay. Again, the uh, the point that was made earlier was in, in an 87-year-old, what's your uh, long-term plan, you know, what's the life expectancy or age-adjusted life expectancy of an 87-year-old is probably in the 7 to 10-year range. So it's, will even if they progress on acalabrutinib, can you salvage them with venetoclax or can they get five or seven years out of acalabrutinib even at the once-a-day dosing? And I think that's not unreasonable. And similarly, for xanabrutinib, if you look at the occupancy data for xanabrutinib, the 160 milligrams BID has the best and followed by the 320 once a day, but it does drop a tad. And that's when the BID dosing, especially if you go to the 80 milligrams BID dose, that is probably number two, followed by 320 and followed by once a day. Uh, so, you know, uh, so it's, it does suffer to a little bit if you do once a day dosing with the Xanu. That is an option and you'd still get 90 plus percent, but you get the best occupancy when you do have the 160 BID dosing of Xanu. So some cool cases in the chat room we won't talk about. It. I'll just mention Dr. Kumar has an 87-year-old man who couldn't tolerate a cow full dose. Actually, he ended up giving the patient you know, a creative three times a week treatment. Marilyn has an elderly uh, a man with CLL and MDS has worsening uh, CLL and uh, has grade three cytopenias and the calibrutinum now on hold. What do you do about the MDS? I'll just put that in your mind to think about it. Maybe we'll get to that later. But uh, Carrie, I wanted to ask you an important practical issue. Uh, until recently, you haven't been able to give uh, CALA and a PPI, a real practical problem. That problem now appears to have been solved. I don't even know if we're going to have the old formulation anymore. Is this just straightforward, no problem. Is that what you're using now, Carrie? Yeah, I was told that we will not be having the capsule formulation anymore and have been switching everyone over to tablets. I do not have a problem doing that. 
Um, one of the reasons um, before Xanabrutinib was approved, um, I was prescribing Ibrutinib as people that just really need their PPIs. This is Ohio. Everyone's on PPIs in Ohio. I don't know if you've been here. Lots of people are overweight and have acid reflux. Um, so I feel like my clinic now is a bunch of people celebrating. So they come in. I'm like, oh, yeah, just so you know, your calibrutinib is going to look different. It's tablets instead of capsules now. Don't panic. The pharmacy sent you the right drug. And I think the specialty pharmacies are like telling people. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And that means you can go ahead and take stomach acid reducers and I have people like skipping out of my clinic that they don't have to take an H2 blocker like two hours after their dose and all this stuff. So I think from a patient perspective, that's huge. So, All right, let's get into some more cases. And of course, the biggest issue that uh, you hear from docs in practice is cardiovascular issues. We have several cases there. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Well, continuing on our theme, we start out with an 89-year-old man, a patient of Dr. Matt Amaral. Here's the case. I started with Ibrutinib. He then developed onset of atrial fibrillation. Also had some other heart issues that he met with his cardiologist. We decided to hold the drug after being on it for about a month and a half. When the cardiologist saw him, he said, hey, listen, you have CLL. This is what we need to do for your treatment. These options all have a risk of developing abnormal heart rhythms or atrial fibrillation. So the cardiologist said, hey, I'll control the rhythm if you want to go ahead and restart his drugs. So he restarted a couple of weeks later. He did start on full dose, but we did have to lower the dose to the next lowest dose in the middle at 280 milligrams due to fatigue, low counts. My biggest question for the faculty would be, would their suggestion be to go back to the original medication that he was tried or to pick one of the other BTK inhibitors to try on the patient? What had you choose Ibrutinib to start with? So it was insurance-based for him. So we didn't talk about that part of whether you would give Ibrutinib, but that's all you can give insurance-wide. I don't know if it's ever going to get generic. That would make it even more interesting. But uh, Farouk, any thoughts about this case? Uh, uh, And would you uh, go to continue with BTK inhibition? If so, what would you use? So unfortunately, there's one insurance company in the entire U.S., and I'm familiar with that experience, which forces you to use Ibrutinib as frontline setting, even after multiple very heated arguments uh, with the top brass at that insurance company that I've been personally involved in. So I, that's wow. extremely frustrating for me. But it's just one company, and I won't take any names wow. right now. But yeah, so hmm. everybody else has given me no problems whatsoever. And this is something that I've heard from the guys in Florida uh, and other places too. So unfortunately, that does happen. Fortunately, it happens very rarely. Uh, we also should, uh, and again, from my practice, I don't use Ibrutinib in anyone above 70. Um, and there is more and more data that patients above 70 tend to have worsening issues with um a cardiotoxicity with Ibrutinib, including sudden cardiac deaths. So uh, that's a non-starter right there for me. Uh, secondly, um, I, in my experience, I don't think that AFib is a dose-dependent effect. Now, I agree with myalgias, fatigue, uh, rashes, that you can dose-reduce and you might get benefit and they might have better tolerability, but at least in my experience, um, maybe once in a while you might get away with it, but especially if they have a prior history of AFib, it's not going to be- get better necessarily if you dose reduce. Uh, you might get lucky, it might not be as bad, but it still comes back and it becomes an issue. I have not had good luck, again, with rhythm control. Uh, I have had patients who underwent cardio ver- version, and the minute they get back on a Brutnip, it comes right back. So I go with the rate control and possibly anticoagulation, which again becomes very tricky if the risk of bleeding is higher than the risk of stroke. And we can talk about that all day. Um, but uh, essentially, this person needs to be evaluated by a cardio-oncologist uh, because I think they are getting more and more aware of all the nuances that uh, are with these BTK inhibitors. And that's why we um, uh, feel that these kind of patients need to be managed by a cardio-oncologist. And that's, a, uh, that's a, probably the most important piece of this whole discussion. I'm not sure how many cardio oncologists are in Akron. Maybe, uh, Carrie, you can tell me. Before you comment, I want to hear another story. I'm sure you hear these stories all day long in your clinic, Carrie. 
Uh, this is a patient of Dr. Eric Lee, an 84-year-old man. Interesting how these patients seem to be elderly, huh? Anyhow, uh, of course, CLL, you see that. But uh, here's Dr. Lee. So this 84-year-old man with CLL was started on ibrutinib, had a pretty fairly rapid resolution of his thrombocytopenia. He had been on treatment for probably about a year and a half and, uh, and asked me whether it was safe for him to travel. I said, absolutely. So he traveled to Poland, was having a wonderful time right there. And I got a call from a hospital from a physician over there telling me, oh, yeah, um, this is your patient, got admitted for AFib with RVR. And so I thought it was actually quite nice that they called me from abroad to discuss the case. The question is, if we can get the AFib under control, and most of the cases we can, would there be a role in continuing the BTK inhibitor or maybe switching over to one of the alternatives? Pertibrutinib appears to be nearing approval for CLL. Is the data for atrial fibrillation better compared to the earlier BTK inhibitors? I think I actually heard a recent program where one of your investigators said that the cardiac toxicity of pertibrutinib is much less than the either the first and second generation BTK inhibitors. So, uh, Kerry, uh, any thoughts about uh, this case and how, how you'd be thinking it through? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think AFib, too, like, is is more common in the elderly, so it's kind of a setup for this being an issue, too, in, like, older um, people. Um, when I think about this, I always think about, like, the risk-benefit of continuing the medication. So when we had ibrutinib in clinical trials and had people that got a decade and a half of chemotherapy, we would do anything to keep them on ibrutinib and try to control the AFib and do that. I think now there's so many other options that there's not really this impelling need to get them to tolerate ibrutinib and just control the cardiac side effects otherwise. And so um, I always think like, especially if someone has atrial fibrillation, like, can we stop the ibrutinib? Because at a year, probably that we're what, like a year and a half, probably the remission's not going to be very long. In fact, um, you know, for people that discontinued early in a major clinical trial, it's about two years before you have to do something again. However, I've had people that have been on ibrutinib for five, six, seven years, or even other BTK inhibitors that develop a toxicity. And you're like, you know, why don't we just see when we have to do something next? So I think always when you think about like, what what's the need for treatment right now? Like, what's the need to restart this? I always think that through first. First. And then this this person's going to need more treatment. And I, I do think if they want to try rate control or rhythm control and still have a BTK inhibitor, the risk is still there with xanabrutinib and acalabrutinib. But I certainly would try switching to one with a lower incidence. I think the decision to think about pertubrutinib is a completely different decision because I kind of view that more similar to switching to venetoclax as switching to a different class of drugs, especially when you look at like not a lot of long-term data in the setting of switching. The resistance mechanisms might impact your ability to use other drugs. So I think that's a, I guess that would be an option, but I would put that in the same, I put that in the same mental category as switch to venetoclax or switch to a different complete class. I don't kind of see pertubrutinib, even though it hits the same target as the same kind of like class. So uh, Farouk, uh, a couple of people are asking about ventricular arrhythmias, sudden death. It looks like a couple of people have read, read your paper that you two were both, I think, both on looking at in Acala. Most of the data up to now has been, I think, with ebrutinib. Uh, any thoughts about ventricular arrhythmias, Farouk? But also the importance of hypertension and the development of cardiovascular morbidities of BTK and how closely you follow blood pressure in these patients and how aggressive you are about managing their hypertension? Um, so the complicated question uh, because um, there's always uh, this thing about how do you detect if somebody is getting ventricular arrhythmia before they have a sudden cardiac event. You know, that's it's just unfortunate. But um, the, uh, it's very challenging to identify patients who will have ventricular arrhythmia because as we know, um, they don't make it to the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of cases. So any study that looks at these outcomes will always have the inherent um, weakness or deficiency that these are these are retrospective um, reviews. These are a case series, uh, small numbers of patients, patients who had it in the peri-hospital, maybe in the hospital post-op um, uh, or some other 
issue that they were managed right away. So there's always going to be major biases uh, with regards to patient selection. Uh, having said that, con- controlling for all of that, um, you still see a significantly higher signal with ibrutinib, which appears to be slightly less with acalabrutinib. And again, I think we now know from um, elderly ibrutinib studies that the um, toxicity and certain cardiac death rates is much higher in the older patient population. And we don't see something similar uh, with the acalabrutinib in the elderly patients. Now, maybe with more patients who are 70 and above treated with acalabrutinib, that might change in the future. Who knows? But the documentation of certain um, the ventricular arrhythmias is very challenging. So one of the major uh, criticisms of that paper was, hey, how do you define ventricular arrhythmia. So, you know, because a lot of these patients had symptomatic PVCs, which may not sound as scary, but it's still pretty substantial. It's a significant cardiac effect. So that's that's the big thing. So I think that's part one of the answer. So we don't want any of our patients to die, not from the disease, but from the drug. And if there's anything that decreases it, only even by 5%, for me, that's a good enough a decrement in the risk. So I'll take it. Uh, even a 1% decrease with similar efficacy, it's good enough for me to switch. Uh, coming back to the second point about hypertension and how do you manage them, uh, fortunately, we are lucky to have a fairly robust cardio-oncology department in our academic center, and it's a partnership. We do check for baseline cardiovascular risk markers, especially in patients who have a prior history of cardiovascular issues. And then we stratify them. If we do feel that our patients have a very high risk of having cardiovascular issues with BTK inhibitors, we definitely would consider alternative options like venetoclax uh, or maybe xanabrutinib or acalabrutinib and definitely move away from ibrutinib. Secondly, if the patient is on <clears throat> ibrutinib uh, or we are planning on starting a brutinib, and if they have a prior history of AFib, AFib, then they have to be optimized. Thirdly, it's very important to make sure that you work with your pharmacist or at least to run an interaction check with all the medicines that you're on. Because the last thing you want to do is increase the toxicity of these drugs by having something that interferes with the uh, concentration of these drugs. And one more minor point I would make is this holds true not necessarily for AFib and cardiovascular toxicity, but bleeding issues, you know, because we have published that paper primarily from the Ohio State experience, uh, which showed that patients who actually got antiplatelet therapy had a higher risk of bleeding rather than patients who were on anticoagulation other than warfarin. So, you know, this is interesting because you would imagine that, oh, if a patient is on um, um, Eliquis or, you know, uh, uh, Doax, uh, those patients might have a higher risk, but that wasn't really true. If it was a patient who were on aspirin and Plavix, uh, that had a higher risk of major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeds. So these are minor issues that if we pay attention to, we can prevent a lot of issues down the road. So just to let you all know, there's some great slides in the slide deck if you want to check it out, but I don't think we're going to show any of this because the cases are so good and the questions are great. Here's a really great question I never thought about, Carrie, from Maria. If a patient's been on a brutinib for many years with a great response and no adverse events so far, would you switch to a second-generation BTK inhibitor? Um, I have not. I think that if someone is taking something, doing well, and not having any adverse effects, I don't switch. Um, I think it would be unlikely that they develop side effects from a newer drug, but they might. So if they're doing awesome on ibrutinib and you're like, oh, maybe you should switch to a calibrutinib because of the lesser risk of AFib and then they start getting headaches, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to them. So actually if it's working great and they're feeling well and not having any side effects, I don't switch because if it's not broken, like what are you hoping to fix? If it's early in treatment and someone has risk factors for AFib or something, then I would consider it because that's a like a lot that emerges later, but for people years in, I definitely don't. So the chat, we, this is the third row, webinar in a row we've done, and the chat room keeps getting better and better. Ari wants to know the etiology of the bleeding risk with BTK inhibitors, and before you get into that, maybe you can listen to this case from Dr. Ma of a 65-year-old man. This patient had a particular ibrutinib-related 
bleeding complication, pretty significant nosebleed. And so we decided to give him a dose reduction. Eventually, we did abort and change his treatment. But my question retrospectively is, if we have a burnt nipple related bleeding complication, is a better idea to change to underline our treatment? Is the bleeding risk really reduced with reduced dose or is just as dangerous? We should just move on. Can you talk more about exactly what happened in terms of the bleeding? So he had bleeding in his semen. He has ear bleed, has uncontrolled headache and large bruising, ecchymosis. That's his bleeding. Carrie, any thoughts? Yeah, so the bleeding, there's an established antiplatelet effect of BTK inhibitors that um, people have shown using like platelet agrogometry and all this uh, really fancy stuff from more classical hematology that I like to pretend I know something about that I know less about than the like um, classic hematologist. And they actually, there was one paper actually looking at um, lowering drug dose with ibrutinib and seeing less impact on like these platelet functional assays. Um, clinically, for me, for bleeding, it, I, I've not seen a lot of improvement with the lower dose, although I think you can, and it, it just matters how bad the bleeding is. So if I have someone that's hospitalized for BTK inhibitor-related bleeding, developing anemia from it, you know, something that's really severe, I don't want to try to roll the dice on doing that again. For someone who's just like bruised up everywhere... You could try switching to a different BTK inhibitor, like from ibrutinib to a calibrutinib. Just clinically, some of the minor bleeding seems to be a little less, although that's very hard data from clinical trials because the CTCAE we use for like our clinical trials with these drugs doesn't capture bleeding as well as something like the ISTH um, bleeding assessment. Um, so you look at clinical trials, say, oh, the bleeding's about the same, but when you take care of patients, it, it might not be that way. And if you used a bleeding scale, you might be able to see that a little more. Um, or like dose reduction to be reasonable, but for severe life-threatening or really problematic bleeding, I will switch some, I'll switch to something else. All right, Farouk, finally, 62-year-old patient, but this is a patient with Waldenstrom, but anyhow, here's the case. He started ibrutinib initially in September 2020, and the cycle 2 rituxan was added. But his treatment had to be stopped because he had significant elevation of his liver enzyme. His question is that when he has progression of the disease, you know, is there a role for a different BTK inhibitor given his LFT abnormalities? It would be interesting to know if there are different LFT adverse reactions amongst the different BTK inhibitors inhibitors because the mechanism action of the BTK inhibitors are somewhat different. Any other questions? In general, they're well tolerated. I have generally shied away from BTK inhibitor in a patient who needs anticoagulation or has been on anticoagulation, therapeutic anticoagulation, and also who has atrial fibrillation. But I don't see a specific guideline in terms of the use of the BTK inhibitor in those settings. And it will be nice to clarify that. So, uh, Farouk, the transaminases were over 400, she told me. Any thoughts about her question about would it be worth considering a different BTK inhibitor? And uh, how do you approach patients who are in anticoagulation? So it's interesting. Uh, there's two aspects to this story. Uh, one is uh, she mentioned that uh, when she started the rituximab, that's when she had transaminitis. So, I want to make sure that that's uh, not necessarily related to some sort of a flare reaction that you might get with the brutinib and uh, rituximab combinations. We, I have seen it in my practice when I have used a brutinib with or without rituximab that you do get a flare and I've had a couple of patients with bad kidneys um, as a result not necessarily transaminitis. So that's one thing. <clears throat> Secondly, there is enough data out there that has shown clearly that if you discontinue brutinib because of transaminitis, you can safely switch to a calabrutinib. And those patients, for the vast majority of those patients, do not have worsening of the transaminitis or the grade or degree of transaminitis is better with a calabrutinib. Similar data is available with zanabrutinib. So you can definitely make an argument that you can switch or at least try to switch to another BTK inhibitor and hope that they would not have those side effects. So there are no guidelines, but uh, you can try dose reductions in that setting. I don't feel the dose reductions work in my experience when you have AFib or bleeding issues, but dose reductions might work when you have transaminitis, arthralgias, fatigue, those kind of symptoms.
So, Carrie, here's another case with what I consider one of the most interesting side effects in all of oncology, and I have no idea why the therapy this patient got works, but I keep hearing it over and over. Here's Dr. Gosain. We initiated therapy with acalabrutinib, but headaches was a major concern. But with some caffeine intake, she was able to resolve the headaches. She's not an avid coffee drinker, but she is transformed into one now, and that has helped her headaches. How does she describe the headaches? She described rather diffuse and onset was odd. There was no precipitating symptom to start off those headaches and they were rather diffuse and scattered. Sometimes they were frontal and sometimes occipital and sometimes really diffuse. So you brought up to her the issue of caffeine. She mainly drinks one coffee a day and now she has bumped that up to about two to three at times depending on the headaches and that has resolved her headaches itself. What she used to rate as about seven out of 10 now has gone down to about one out of 10. What caused you to start a calibrutinib on this woman as opposed to ibrutinib? So mainly the concern of atrial fibrillation and bleeding aspects and overall tolerability itself. Uh, though there was a concern of taking it twice a day versus once a day, but I was not too worried about the compliance with this patient. So it was decided because mainly of the atrial fibrillation and bleeding aspect of it. So, so, Carrie, I feel like we talk about caffeine all the time, and yet I constantly am meeting people who have never heard about this. What's your explanation for the pathophysiology, why they get a headache? And do you agree that caffeine works? And if so, why? Yeah, Ashley, I, I, I'm struggling here because I don't actually have a good explanation for why that happens, but we know that it does. You do see headaches with ibrutinib occasionally, so kind of like, you know, I do think you could see them with a whole class, but a calibrutinib, this is like the one side effect that's like consistently always more with a cala. And actually the majority of people aren't as bothered. Like I ask people about headaches when they start a cala and they're like, oh yeah, I did get a headache. I'm like, oh, did you do something? They're like, no, it went away before I thought to. And you're like, fine. So a lot of them are like headaches that aren't really impacting people's functioning. But we do see people like this where it's severe. Sometimes they actually get better like six months in just with time. My, If I had to take a guess, my guess would be it's vascular because uh, caffeine, you know, works for a variety of headaches. You see it work in migraines. Like, you know, that's one of the main components in Excedrin migraine is caffeine. And so um, I think it has to do with, you know, the other thing is, I don't know, it has to do with like fluid balance and headaches. Um, but you see that this is like a common drug that works for different types of headaches, like unrelated to any oncology drugs. Um, so it could be an infect effect on the vasculature. I'm really not sure. I think if I knew that answer, um, I'd probably be a lot more popular than I currently am. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> really interesting. So, for Rick, we're going to skip over a case of a patient who was getting verapamil, and the pharmacy uh, called the doc and said, hey, do you know there's an interaction with the callow? You already mentioned that. But I really wanted to ask about this issue. I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen in first-line mantle cell after ASH. There's a lot of thinking in the younger patients who are transplant eligible that maybe they could get a BTK inhibitor up front combined with chemo and avoid transplant, which would be a, a great quality of life advantage. This uh, patient of Dr. Lamar was actually on a study. I'm pretty sure it was the, the study uh, that we all are aware of that compared BR alone, the SHINE study, to BR plus uh, uh, ibrutinib. And uh, he, the patient actually got randomized to a BR and then on progression got a calibrutinib. Here's Dr. Lamar. This is a 73-year-old gentleman that was diagnosed with stage 4 mantle cell. He had uh, marrow and GI involvement. I put him on a clinical trial that evaluated bendamustine and rituximab plus or minus a calibrutinib. We found out after the fact that he was randomized to rituximab and bendamustine. We found that out when he progressed. And so he crossed over to the acalabrutinib arm. He was on a calibrutinib for a few months, but then progressed. My first question is, in mantle cell lymphoma now, we have three different BTK inhibitors. How are you determining which one to use? Of course, that was before last week, because now we have four, as it always happens in oncology. But any thoughts? You know, uh, the thing I'm thinking about, Farouk, is what, ha you know, we know there was BTK uh, toxicity in the group who got BTK plus chemo. I don't, didn't get much of a feel, a feel for exactly, you know, whether it was worse than uh, regular BTK inhibitors uh, toxicity. 
But just in general, it seems possible that we're going to be moving towards chemo plus uh, BTK in some situations uh, with a mantle cell. Anything you're thinking about in terms of, you know, we can talk a long time about the efficacy and whether to do it, but just in terms of tolerability and safety, anything that you're thinking about or concerned about? Um, very difficult question to answer. The whole field of mantle cell is in a flux right now. Um, so the biggest uh, debates right now is uh, transplant or no transplant, maintenance, no maintenance, CAR T, when to do it. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. And uh, like the presenter mentioned, um, which BTK inhibitor to use? So uh, let's talk about the SHINE trial and the triangle study. I think the problem is, unfortunately, you know, there's uh, doing a 500 patient study and 800 patient study in mantle cell lymphoma. I think this is a huge feat. Right off the bat, we have to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work that goes into these huge studies in rare indications. And I think hats off to uh, the investigators for doing that and also uh, the patients who basically uh, went through all of that. But unfortunately for me, uh, the SHINE study is uh, something that we should not do. Uh, frankly, uh, because if you look at the progression free advantage that you get by adding five years of ibrutinib, it's around 20 to 24 percent or 20 to 24 months, I should say, which is exactly the same PFS advantage you get if you use Akela or Zanu or ibrutinib in the second line setting. So you're getting five years of drug exposure and toxicity with two years of benefit, 18 months to two years of benefit. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. When you could have had that benefit with a three-year drug holiday after an average of four years of remission with BR alone. So to me, that's dead on arrival. The only good thing that will come out of that trial is the fact that ibrutinib might get indication in the frontline setting. And for some of our patients who are not chemo candidates, we can go straight to BTK inhibitor and drop the chemo. So it does help the field move away from chemo in my opinion, chemo plus maintenance BTK should not be used. I will say the same thing for acalabrutinib plus rituximab, and there is another ASH abstract that was published. Now, coming to the triangle study, it was the same issue, uh, same thing. Um, you are demonstrating a benefit uh, with two years of maintenance, but then again, you also have rituximab maintenance and you have prolonged exposure when you can get the same benefit as a second line agent. So that whole defeats the purpose. And can you do a transplant? Can you not do a transplant? You have to um, keep in mind that you do have the best long-term treatment-free data with transplant. Uh, now, I'm not a supporter of transplant, but then how do you factor in the fact that some of your patients who do get CAR T for mantle cell lymphoma in the second relapse, maybe those patients can have durable remissions. And we do have extended follow up from the Zuma 5 study uh, that shows some durability, maybe not cure, but those patients can be cured. So I am a believer of uh, sequential rather than uh, concurrent. Uh, I don't feel like throwing all our bullets at the same time is necessarily better. Um, unless somebody completely convinces me, it's definitely more toxic and you don't add anything in the long run in incurable malignancies. So I'm thinking we need to do another webinar for another hour just to get in all the stuff we didn't get to tonight, but hopefully we're helpful to the audience. And we really appreciate the docs who present these cases, uh, put their therapy out for all of us to take a look at. It's so helpful and we really appreciate their involvement. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Farouk and uh, Carrie, for uh, working with us tonight. Audience, thank you for coming. Uh, come on back next week, and we'll hear what Dr. Miller and Dr. Partridge have to say about breast cancer in younger women, premenopausal patients, the issue of ovarian suppression, fertility, and much, much more. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks, Farouk. Have a good thank you. night. Have a good night.